Ah. Okay. Welcome to the IHR Digital <laughs> Seminar, um, the Georgian Papers program, and we have two speakers I'll introduce in a moment. Three, oh, three of course. <laughs> three speakers, of course, I'll introduce in a moment. Um, uh, my name's Matt Shaw. I can count normally. Um, but, uh, I'm the librarian here at the IHR. Um, and um, before I go any further, I'd just like to advertise our next seminar. If you get a taste for Royal Digital um, seminars, we have um, a paper on Charles I and the Whitehall Palace um, by Nico Muntz of York um, on the 7th of May. And again, that will be live on, on YouTube as well as here in this room. Um, there is a YouTube thing here, so be aware that whatever you say may well be broadcast out there and we can have questions from people later in the session as well. Um, but I'd like to introduce Professor Arthur Burns, um, Professor of Modern History and Academic Director of the Georgian Papers Programme. Um, Sam Callahan, the programme's metadata analyst based at the King's Digital Laboratory, and they've bought some very nice looking bookmarks and uh, <laughs> bottle openers, or key fobs, depending on your the glass is half full or half empty. <laughs> um, and Patricia Medan, program manager and formerly director of archives and information management at King's for over 30 years. And they're going to tell us about this very exciting project, um, a very large and grand project, not least because of the number of partners you can see up there, um, the papers that are involved in it, um, but also its digital scope and reach and ambition. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to three 20-minute papers. No, 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 no. no, no. Less, than less, less than that. Less than that. <laughs> three short papers uh, and then lively discussion from, um, from everybody here in the seminar. Um, to go slightly against form, rather than go straight to the papers, um, our speakers were very interested to know who else is in the room in the seminar because you can all participate. So I don't know, James, you want to say? I'm James. I'm a, a senior lecturer in digital history and archives, University of Sussex, and a convener of the seminar. <laughs> Um, I'm Louise, I'm one of the archivists working on the Georgian Papers programme. Um, I'm Hope, I'm the other archivist. <laughs> 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 uh, I'm Neil, I work for the Digital uh, British Library and one of the conveners of the seminar too. I'm James, I'm a volunteer working on Wikidata. I'm Claire, I'm doing some private research into the early 18th century. I'm, my name's Adam, and I am a senior lecturer of digital history, and I was also one of the fellows of the Georgian Papers Program. Hi, I'm Tessa, and I work at UCL, and I'm also convener of this digital history seminar. So. I'm Justin Colson, lecturer in digital history at the University of Essex, and yet another convener. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Flora Froger, a former uh, Georgian Papers fellow, like Adam, and I write uh, ancient century biography. Thank you, all. thank you all for coming in and participating in this, in this evening's uh, discussions. Uh, right, so I, I'm going to kick off, and my role is to really introduce the, the project. So some, some of this may be familiar to some people in the room, at, at least, but maybe not all of it, and to give a sense of where we are um, in terms of the project's progress and its multi-dimensional character. And then we're going to sort of hone in towards the digital dimensions of the programme. So Patricia talking about why, why we're doing it and how it, how it fits in. And then Sam will actually take us into some of the, the details about metadata and, and, and some of the, the, the projects that are going on now uh, and where we see our ambition as a project lying. And we very much welcome input on this because it's very much a live discussion, uh, partly because we also need to raise funding for bits of what we want to do in the future. So we need to shape what we want to do in ways that actually serve our, our community as we go forward. So we're really looking forward to uh, this discussion. So, so just to kick off, the Georgian Papers programme is a major multi-institution project that originated a few years ago in an agreement between King's College London and the Royal Household. And it was a very high level agreement basically between the principal and the Queen in effect to, to, to undertake uh, this project, which was to digitise and provide open access public uh, dissemination free of charge of the Georgian Papers collection, which is held in uh, the Royal Archives at Windsor Castle, which comes under the banner of the Royal uh, Collection Trust. So there are various different bits of the, the jigsaw, even within each of the, the partners here. And the project was formally launched in 2015 by the Queen herself, uh, with a target date set uh, for the project for 2020, although we now think we're going to extend uh, past that date. And shortly after that initial agreement, uh, the uh, 
the, the partnership enlarged to take in the Omahondra Institute for Early American History and Culture and the College of William and Mary as our North American partners. And uh, th those, that combination, the World Archives, Kings and the Omahondra stroke William and Mary are the, the chief partners in, in, in the project carrying out the core activity, which is distributed roughly in, in the way I set out in, in, in that slide. So that the, the main response to the archives Ed, is the actual digitization of the documents and the cataloging and the main responsibilities for the rest of us is interpretation and academic support and public uh, dissemination and transcription but also that all feeds back in and one of the things i hope we will get over in this presentation is the sense which these things aren't as divided as they might be in, in some other uh, projects and since that initial uh, uh pairing came together various other groupings that we call participants have, have become part of the project with relationships with it but are undertaking very specific aspects of the project so the library of congress has hosted project fellowship for us and we're working with them on a major exhibition on the two georges that will be held in the library of congress shortly and then we'll move back to london at the science museum after that that's george washington and george uh, the third the sons of the american revolution support a uh, visiting professor you can come and hear there Later, just think to give a lecture next week on Thursday, on the 21st of March, or all welcome on Georgian religion and the American Revolution. And the Washington Library of Mount Vernon again, uh, support a fellowship uh, and host, host one first, and Flora Fraser, who's here tonight, was indeed one of the uh, Mount Vernon uh, fellows for the project. So that's all very clear, I hope. So I'm not going to muddy all those waters by showing you this, which is rather blurry, but actually the key thing you need to get from this is just the complexity of the interrelationships between all those different partners, including other subsets like King's Digital Laboratory, who've got particular responsibilities for areas of the work, and a whole range of different activities taking place in the programme, which the collaborations come in different strengths between the base, different partnerships, but there's almost no partner with no finger in each of the parties uh, in some way. We may be leading on different areas, and we, we come up with all kinds of very elaborate descriptions of the project in terms of pillars and themes and, and, and so, but, but actually it's the, it's the interrelationship that's the overarching uh, message for all of us. Now complexity is really a good thing in itself, um, but I think in this case one of the things I would want to, to argue is that it, it's a genuine virtue and something that actually informs things that we're trying to do that, that otherwise I don't think have been quite attempted in the way we we're trying uh, to do them. So, so where's all this got to uh, as we sit here in March 2019? Well, the first thing to report is about 100,000 digital images have now been mounted on the Royal Collection Trust website, which is based at this uh, address here. Um, and that's the repository, where it's a secure repository, it's a calm uh, repository. Uh, and that's where the actual documents sit when they've been digitized along with the cataloging that's been done by the archivists at uh, the Royal Archives. And uh, as I say, 100,000 already there, uh, the more ready to go, and already we've got up there the papers of William IV, uh, the early Hanoverians, not much survives from them, because it's not just George III, this project that was often thought of in those terms, George III's essays, his medical papers, many of which weren't easily accessible before online, the first parts of George III and George IV's official calendars of correspondence as well. So there's a lot of uh, material up there that's fairly core to the project, as well as other minor collections, uh, and we're part of proceeding in terms of ease of digitization and demand so we're trying to re reflect what people want to see in the way that's being done and this is roughly what we think is in georgian papers uh the, 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 it's very hard to know quite what some of these labels mean and they, they they're derived ultimately from box labels rather than actually analysis of what's in the boxes and the more we proceed through this uh, the better the knowledge we have of what's in there and i'll say a little bit more about that uh, later on um, but you can see there that there's, a, there's a, a wide variety of different types of papers, some of which are absolutely centrally part of the, 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 the archives of individual monarchs and their families, others which reflect the work of the royal household, others which have migrated into the royal archives through purchase or uh, very other processes over the years. And they can be broken up in various different ways. That was by source. Here's one which thinks about what they're about. And again, a very distinct feature of this is the sheer range of material. Uh, of interest to scholars of very different types, certainly not just historians, uh, e easily literary scholars, you know, music scholars, historians of the armed forces, um, architecture, art, agriculture. There's a significant deposit in each of these areas, and many of these 
proportion but also also as we go through the archives because they overlap in terms of where the stuff is is, is to be found so that's what we've got to do to putting the stuff up onto the web and looking at it we've also been working on the interpretation so more than 40 fellows in sponsored by the project have already been into the archive under the auspices of the program and the first publications that are coming out of that work are just beginning to emerge uh, now rick atkinson's book which is due out in May, the first uh, monograph or, or, mon or full-sized uh, book that studied the flex work done in the archives but a number of articles have already been published by others and we discuss these the work of the fellows in various symposia and conference and panels that we've been putting on things like b-sex or our own symposium at Windsor, where we brought together an awful lot of the fellows uh, to talk about the work. So that programme of investigation and actual research has been part of what we've been doing. Um, we've also um, put a website together, which is the George Page website, uh, which won, along with the RCT one, holding the documents of the BSEC Prize for Digital Resources this year. Um, that, that hosts all the blogs and other materials uh, and the interpretations uh, that we've been producing from our academics and others and from the digital humanists working on the project as well we write about what we're doing there um, it also hosts online exhibitions of which this is the most recent which we put together in which a, a white rose uh, doctoral training partnership uh, student put together an exhibition on the essays of george iii we we did the processing of the stuff she did the academic work and wrote the uh, the commentary and we did the transcriptions and, and that's put together as, as her exhibition and we're hoping to encourage more people to come and do these kind of exhibitions we've also done some ourselves through as part of our public and outreach work and i think that's proven a very effective way of exploring the research that's going on uh, in in the uh, program it's also the home of the king's friends network which is our, our kind of outreach to the academic community and others and independent scholars with an interest in the program that now numbers over 400 who've signed up to follow uh, project as it goes along um, not just academics either it's quite interesting breakdown the people who've chosen to, to to take an interest in the program about 64 65 percent from the historians about 10 percent from literature nine percent archivists uh, about 45 percent established academics but 20 percent ecrs which is very good 23 percent independent scholars uh, 65 percent from the uk 30 percent from uh, the US and a uh, substantial number from Europe. So it's a, it's a good mix of people taking an interest in the programme across the world and they get regular updates and they're encouraged to apply for fellowships and, and, and get advance notice of when things may be appearing so they can plan their research a, a, around that. Alongside that, we're seeing the programme of transcription, which will feed into the metadata, which again to be talking about later. And that's got quite a long way again, we transcribed now fully the Georgian essays, which is more than 8,000 pages. Uh, of, of, of text and those other projects are underway and Sam may say a bit more about that I think in her presentation. Works also proceeding on digital humanities development, again which we're going to hear about uh, later. A striking feature of the recent life of the project has been a, a body of uh, public outreach work. Uh, we had a TV documentary which began my start the programme uh, from BBC which was seen by over 2 million, but we've been doing public lectures, uh, presentations and we've worked with both Hamilton and the recent production of The Madness of King George uh, to reach new audiences, both through uh, material that they produced and put online through their social media. So we were tweeted by Lynn Manning and Miranda, which is a tweet for us. Uh, but we also took Mark Gatiss out to, uh, to, uh, to Windsor, and that became the, the basis of the pre-show entertainment for the National Theatre Live production that went to five countries in 2000 uh, cinemas across the, the, the world. And we have this big exhibition that will be taking place in the Library of Congress, which is the first time that the uh, papers of George III will have crossed into America and when they come back for the first time in Washington, so left uh, the US, I think. Uh, and we're reading the books that will go along, uh, well, judging to the book that will go along with that uh, at the moment. Along the way, we've begun to make research discoveries, which are the kind of research discoveries occasionally get into the newspapers. So we found the first recorded purchase of uh, Jane Austen, uh, which turned out to be the Prince Regent before it was even published uh, in, 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 in the archive. Uh, some interesting uh, revelations too uh, about uh, Princess Amelia that have come, been, been produced by uh, uh, one of the academics looking at her medical history and some interesting uh, discussions of her illness and its treatment regimes. Um, so it's clear that they are, there are going to be substantial research findings here, new, new light on the American Revolution as well as has come to light. There's a whole series of discoveries that will be coming out in monographic uh, form in the not too distant future. 
we've begun to, I think, identify some research questions of our own, which will have led to the next few years, such as how, what is the nature of this archive and how is it formed and what does that tell us about the questions we're investigating through it? There's a lot of very useful input from within the Royal Archives team there about thinking about what the archive is and where it came from and how it, how it uh, has, has, has come together. And that's very interesting. We're developing collaborations with other projects. We're looking for ways that we know our materials will be used to other people. And because we don't have a question of our own, we're, we're, we're keen to form those collaborations with others and work with them together on their projects. And finally, there's been a, a fair bit of education work coming out of it, which is again, beginning to gather steam now. Uh, so um, this is from a course I teach at King's where students have to build a digital object around a document of their choice. They receive no teaching at all about George III as part of the course. All they get taught about is how to do an edition and how to use Xerti, the software developed at the University of Nottingham for VLEs, but which we use for them to build a digital edition around a document of their choice. And those students have come up with a number of new discoveries about the documents which we're going to be able to feed back into projects. So that's been exciting. It's the best teaching I've ever done, uh, frankly. And the, the digital humanities component of it is, is thrilling uh, for me and I think really quite exciting for the students as well. So that's what we're doing. So uh, I'm going to finish my section by just thinking about so what do I think are the key distinctive uh, features of, of this project. And I've, and I've highlighted a few things that I think are, are worth uh, highlighting. So the first is just that collaboration I talked about right at the outset. And it's a really complex and uh, in, involving collaboration, which brings its own rewards, but its own challenges. We're all very different institutions with different types of protocols. And the, for the Royal Household, obviously, it's a very different way from an HEI. Um, British academic institutions work in different ways from American, work in different funding environments, and all those kind of things produce a really quite complicated infrastructure which, which produces challenges of its own, some of which can actually produce new approaches, but others which can appear to be a little frustrating. The second thing that's distinctive about it, I think, is that we don't have a research question of our own. We, we began simply from this ambition of what, in the old days, would have been called resource enhancement, I suppose. In the old HRC schemes to, to get this stuff online. And that, that's um, meant in some ways that it's more tricky for us in terms of the British funding models for academic research because increasingly British academic research with the digital component is only funded if you've got a research question rather than just the digitization project in itself. Now, I have very significant problems with that because of my own experience about how research grows out of digitization. I suggest that's a false uh, distinction and a rather unhelpful one. But it, it, it's made it for us very much the case that the, the content of the archive has to drive what we do and we don't really know what that is as clearly as ideally we would do if, if being in that situation. Um, so it, it, it's led to a very different kind of research community around it. Um, we're not drawn together by a shared set of research interests but in fact just by a shared archive and that uses a different kind of academic conversation around the contents and in, within the project that's enormously stimulating for us because in fact People with very different research interests have been thrown into close proximity and all kinds of sparks fly out of that, which then feed back into uh, the programme. As I say, that part of the reason that's a challenge is because we don't know the contents of the archive particularly well. Um, perhaps 15% have previously been published in one form or another, not always in perfect form, but some of the editions are quite ancient and very far from perfect. Um, and as I said earlier, that the knowledge of the archive is often restricted to box level descriptions, which can be miscellaneous uh, or, or similar levels. Um, and of course, it was also an archive which was rather difficult to access before digitization. That although Royal Archives have always been open for use in some form, that the restrictions have been quite severe, the space restrictions remain severe, limited hours, and, and so on. Um, so, we even things you might think of would have been used a lot, actually not been as used as you might expect, but uh, people have concentrated on using the printed editions in the past. So that's a challenge in ourselves to know what we could do, because we just don't know our, our way around it. And the catalogue is being made as we go along. It's not that there's an existing catalogue we can refer to, there's no catalogue as such. What we do find out as we go through is that the archive is very heterogeneous, and patching its survival. And of course, that presents its own problems because people may think there are going to be things there that actually then prove not to be there. So again, determining what research agenda is going to be uh, is not always straightforward. It's not even straightforward. The archive of the royal family, the, 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 the survival within that, we increasingly realize is very particular and, and to be explained by particular conjunctions. Um, 
and different acquisition policies. And it's important to remember that even some of the Royal Papers had not always been in the Royal Archives. They had gone out and come back in again. Though not as many as we used to think, but being pretty clear, some more were lying around within the Royal Palaces than was uh, initially thought. It, is, it also has all kinds of potential which you have to be alert to, so that the global potential of this archive is considerable, because it contains material of veterans right across the globe because of the global reach of the British monarchy in this period. And we hope to uh, re reflect that and all kinds of connections with other European archives that, that potentially are very exciting. So we're hoping to make those kind of collections because if, unless we can make those connections tangible, the real potential of this, this, this archive won't be realized. It can't be a standalone project. Not only does not have research questions, the most interesting questions taken into other archives all the time. We're rolling it out as we go. So we're publishing the papers as we go, rather than waiting until the edition is complete. And that's not obviously unique and has all kinds of uh, advantages, but also requires particular uh, challenges as well, I think. Um, and, I, and I think we're trying to make a, a virtue of that. And we're, we're trying to concertine a whole set of processes that in most projects have been done in sequence, starting with our kind of a conservation through to uh, publication. We're trying to do the cataloguing and the investigation and the publication at the same time. And rather than that just being a necessity, actually it, it produces all kinds of synergies between those processes of cataloguing and research and publication of public engagement that you otherwise wouldn't be there. We can get mutually helpful feedback across all those aspects of the project as a result of that. And I think that's a really interesting process for us in, in which we feel we need things to make it easier to do because there isn't really a suitable platform for that to happen. And it's something we're going to be talking about in the second part of the presentation. Well, how, how can we make that, that sort of interaction we think is our USP really easier and facilitate? Um, finally, therefore, we don't see this as a standalone project at all. It, it, one way of thinking of it is as a hub, a meeting place. Who could we invite into this discussion? How can we get them there? How can we get them to share our materials so we can learn out our materials from their work and they can also learn about their projects from our knowledge of our materials? What, what would the platform look like that would support that? And just finally, two very personal reflections. So just, and I've been involved in digital history for a long time, it's 20 years since my first digital project had started now, um, and um, it's still going on, inevitably. And for me, this project uh, builds on my experiences with that earlier project, the clergy of the Church from the database and various other things I've been involved with over the years, to, to emphasize three of my main thoughts as a digital historian over the years. They're not particularly brilliant or perceptive, they're just things I really very strongly First is that this is, not, this is not an academic project being supported by technicians, which is often the hardest thing for me to get over to people who've never worked in digital history. Just how much of my research agenda comes from the work of people who are fundamentally concerned with the design of software and making it work, and just how much more I understand my archives as well of their work and of the archivists. And it's very important to me that all those people get proper credit in this project and being the academic director is in that sense, not being the chief honcho here, it's just being one part of one strand of the project. We may, there may be lots of things I want to make the final call on, but actually other people are much better informed than I am about what we should do in all kinds of ways to maximise the academic outcomes. Secondly, we should not in this project ever fetishise completion, because I think completion is always a slightly uncertain goal for any digital humanities project for all kinds of reasons, not least what happens to our projects when they are finished. There's, it's all too easy for them just to die. And for that reason, we really need to make the most of the time while it's alive, which for me is the period when it's underway. And actually the, the interactions of the digital project and the digital uh, research to me are where its heart lies. And if we don't make full use of that now because we're too worried about getting it finished and perfect before we try and doing those things, we will never get them done. And that's been my experience with the closure database it's not finished, but boy, has it transformed the way we do work in that area for 15 years, even though it's massively incomplete uh, all the time. And finally, uh, the, the, the again, I used to have, perhaps not so much now, but people used to tell me that what we did was replacing uh, uh, archival research. It doesn't. It drives you back into the archive with completely new questions that you would never realise were even interesting without the digital aspect of the project. And that's why the geological is so central, and that's why I'm going to hand it to Sam 
to talk about that. Oh, so Patricia, sorry. <laughs> I was just too concentrated on handing over the actual machine. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. Um, my first slide. <clears throat> uh, my slide is quite minimal, and um, credit for the first set of three pictures of the Royal Collection of Trust. Um, Arthur's introduced you to the, the very rich scope of the Georgian Papers programme, and it's given you an idea of our activities and how we operate as a partnership. Sam's shortly going to dive deeper under our digital bonnet, but before she does so, I'm going to very briefly explain some of the drivers for the programme and take you back a little bit in time before some of the things Arthur's been talking about to explain why we are taking the approach, which I think most of us now believe is a very considerable strength, but in the early days felt like utter madness to do research for materials that hadn't been catalogued. Um, so an appetite to do things differently. We'll, let's start with Queen Victoria. It seems back to front since it's a Georgian Papers programme. But Queen Victoria's diaries were digitised and published to coincide with the Queen's Diamond Jubilee. As anybody who's looked at it will know, it's a great product um, produced by ProQuest in collaboration with the Bodleian and received a very warm reception at the launch for the British press. Downstream, however, there was concern uh, within the staff of the Royal Household and notably the Queen's private secretary, who's also Keeper of the Royal Archives and the Deputy Keeper, about several aspects of this work. First, the, the external teams brought in by ProQuest and outsourced by the Bodley had done a very effective job, but the internal archival team, it was thought, had played very little part and had, in, had had insufficient opportunity to learn about the process or develop their understanding beyond what they already knew about the content. Secondly, follow-up scholarly usage and interpretation was regarded by them as underwhelming. Thirdly, there had been complaints, notably from the Commonwealth, about the paywall. And finally, there were growing concerns internally about the strategic wisdom of farming out the sustainability of products like these purely to the commercial sector. When Keynes was approached initially about George III's papers, um, there was already a clear appetite to do things differently. Um, when I was tasked by the then principal to find out more, I was told firmly that access rather than delivery of an income stream, however welcome, was the key driver, which from the King's point of view was the right one, and that King's had been approached because of its key role in professional leadership in the archival field, its reputation in digital humanities, and its ongoing commitment to 18th century studies. I also learned, as Arthur said, that a majority of papers were uncatalogued, um, that models of access were very heavily reliant on the knowledge of the in-house team and reliant on their producing the documents that they thought answered the inquiries. An approach, whether justified or not, elicited academic concern and occasional accusations of prejudicial access, um, which is press that nobody wanted. Um, I also learned that several staff with, long, uh, with very long service were retiring, and with them, of course, the knowledge that they had being lost. That there was an appetite for change here was here, as well as um, they were just about to appoint a new librarian in the Royal Collections Trust, and it was already agreed that they would be given local oversight of the archives and charged given an agenda of modernisation. Oh, next slide, please. So we began, so setting up the store for digital humanities. The first thing we wanted to achieve was a meeting of minds between what the household and the Royal Collection Trust had in mind and what information professionals and digital humanists could do and might want to do. We held a seminar on the 6th of March 2015 for experienced information professionals, notably archivists, digital humanists, including established academics, ECRs and PhDs, and key household and RCT staff including IT and content support. We asked our digital humanists to give us a flavour of what they could do, might want to do. They demonstrated aspects of prosopography, social and correspondence networks, mapping and geospatial humanities, computational linguistics, natural language processing, text analysis, visualisation and aestheticisation of data, and the deployment of crowd in terms of building a community or free labour. Um, I think they blew the socks off our colleagues from the Royal Collections Trust. <laughs> And it was a nice it was a nice seminar um the outcomes of the seminar was 
universal enthusiasm to go for it, if you like. So we concluded unanimously that the Georgian Papers programme should be as open as possible for all of these types of exploration manipulation. And for the, his, this to happen to the very fullest extent, every word needed to be searchable. Um, be careful what you ask for, I think, for that one. We agreed that the GPP should be guided by the principles set out by the Strategic Content Alliance report towards uh, a UK digital public space, a blueprint report published in November 2014, then fairly hot off the press, uh, which requires that everything that we do should be permanent, described, free to find, built on open standards, navigable, contextualised, quality assured, trustworthy, all entirely sensible things which we all signed up to. Um, if anybody's got any detailed questions about that, I can flesh them out a little uh, in questions. We also had uh, a sharing of concerns about what can go wrong with digital humanities. Um, there was the, the curse of the project, the risk of short-term thinking that fails to commit to service goals, sustainability, continuing improvement, resulting in landlocking of data fit for only one project. Um, Arthur's commented on the merits of what we're doing now is some continuing improvement. Um, potential issues around IPR, licensing, commercial negotiations, which encourage conservative and restrictive data, uh, use of data and worse paywalls, um, internal, external politics that can inhibit collaborations, insufficient attention given to digital literacy and the end users, no browse facility, poorly figured can search logistics, um, excessive use of jargon, disciplinary concerns, those sort of things. I would be painting too glowing a picture if I said we've not been around the houses several times on some of these issues, um, but we got there. So our immediate follow-up actions at the time were agreed to include a survey of recommended good digital sites. We wanted to build on what was out there that was worth having. Um, a decision to pilot test automated handwritten transcription. Um, and the building out of UCAT, which is the UNESCO-based hierarchical subject of terms, um, including generating terms through natural language processing using VOI and so forth, um, tested on Fortescue, an addition of over a million words. Um, so I'll be saying more about these last two exercises. The next slide, please. And now we've got to do it before. Um, when we began, we had no idea how extensive the papers were, what they covered, who created them, what type of material, or whether it was in a fit state to be digitised. We made a joint appointment of a project coordinator with the Royal Collections Trust to conduct a review. Some of Arthur's slides of, of, about content reflect the work of Oliver Walton. We did not want to reinvent wheels, but to build an academic and cultural network. We arranged or contributed to seminars and presentations by the BL, the British Museum, the National Maritime Museum, Science Museum and others, including Harvard, William and Mary and the Omohundra Institute, as well as internal seminars. We were determined to be interdisciplinary and we wanted to be clear about relevant research in progress, new lines of inquiry, and fit to other initiatives, such as the Science Museum's development of new galleries. Uh, at King's, we own the King George III scientific uh, equipment displayed there. Um, at the suggestion of and with significant uh, support by our then partner, the Omohundre, we initiated a series of short fellowships for academics to explore interests in the archives. On the understanding that they may le learn little relevant to their own research, but might also uh, be asked to feed back on what they found to the catalogers in the archives, um, so that that would help um, their work. They were also uh, asked to feed back terms they used in searching so that the we can ensure sure that these are used in subjects as well. Right. We contacted the Bentham Project at UCL with a view to using the transcribers product for transcription, and we've joined the International Partnership of Users Contributing Data to build its model and now have a bid into the US National Endowment and Humanities Fund to support the modelling and tabular data. We learned from Sam's predecessors, a uh, survey of sites cross over, a mix of some 47 sites internationally offering transcriptions, historical databases, meta aggregators, online finding aids and online editions. Some of our findings were surprising. 97% offered some form of keyword searching, but only 40% um, offered refinement by filter or facet searching. 56 allowed some form of browsing, which is surprisingly low to me. 48% included 
some form of authority records, but 80% of those that did so used standards. 50% uh, provided open access to their contents or descriptive metadata, but growing numbers were using um, Creative Commons licensing, which is what we now use as well. And my final slide, uh, this is uh, the transit of Venus, the navigational exploration of 1769. This is from the King's own observations at the Kew Observatory and forms part of the George III Archives at King's College London. Um, it's not my experience that in archival and digital terms there is any truth in the idea that if you build it, they will come. For that to happen, they need to know the existence of the resource and to think it might be interesting or useful. For GPP, uh, this is the significance, I think, in many ways of the academic and public outreach interpretation all happening at the same time. The alternative on the digital front is that they need to find it because a Google type search has pulled it up as a response to the search terms they've used. For this to be effective, um, a multidisciplinary international audience, for, for a multidisciplinary international audience, the search needs to be underpinned by the use of a hierarchy of terms that includes those that are widely used, um, reflect discipline specific choices, reflect differing international usage of terms, and different use of terminology over time. Um, and for this to be effective for sharing, for collaboration, it needs to be rigorously standards based. Compliance with internationally recognized standards is equally key to ensuring sustainability of the archive, original and digital, and the possibility of sharing where appropriate. Uh, for GPP, this includes now includes everything from conservation and digitization to a basic catalog to building subject to SORE and name authorities. Um, and I think I'd like to reiterate what Arthur said, that we now see this approach. It may not have been the ideal place to start in some ways, but increasingly we're seeing this intermixing of approaches as a strength, not a weakness. And with that, I'll hand over to Sam. <laughs> Uh, so this diagram shows at a high level the workload for the preparation of the Georgian papers for access to the public and to the wider scholarly community. The Royal Archives are responsible for scanning and production of baseline records, and that's up in the top left there. They make the papers freely available as PDFs through their Georgian papers online website. They also make the image scans and catalogue records available to King's Digital Lab, that is KDL, and through us to our technical partners in the US, William and Mary. William and Mary are responsible for the production of full text transcriptions. Currently, there are two mechanisms um, by which these transcriptions are being produced through crowdsourcing and also a handwritten text recognition tool that Patricia was talking about, and I will discuss that um, further on. A collaborative workspace currently in development at KDL aggregates all of this data images, catalogue records, and transcriptions, and also offers additional ways to augment the provided metadata through subject indexing and name authority um, creation or the creation of person and organisation records. The collaborative workspace is built to solicit requirements from both academics and information professionals, and so is somewhat of a hybrid platform. It brings the rigour required by archivists through the implementation of archival standards but offers flexibility to scholars in allowing them to correct and augment almost all data surfaced in the workspace. The final part of the workflow is the provision of the enhanced metadata records back to the Royal Archives. This round trip of metadata ensures that after review by archivists out at Windsor, they can draw appropriate information into the canonical records that they hold. Um, I'm going to preface my discussion about the collaborative workspace with a brief description of the software development life cycle we use at KDL. This is an industry proven agile project management model. After initial contact by a potential partner and reviewing if the project idea is a good fit for the lab, we undertake a requirements assessment and produce a product quote with Moscow prioritized requirements. Um, Moscow stands for must have, should have, could have and won't have this time. <laughs> Agile development focuses on producing technical products on time and in budget. 
you do so, some wiggle room is given in the form of should have and could have requirements. Unusually for the GPP, rather than discussing requirements with just our immediate project partners, we also elicited requirements from GPP fellows and other interested academics and scholars at a workshop in September 2017. Some prioritisation of requirements was also undertaken there. Following a signed off product quote, evolutionary development commences. This allows for feedback from partners at various steps in development to ensure that their objectives are being met by the developing project. Upon completion, a service level agreement is signed off and the project goes live. The agreement covers the cost of hosting and maintaining the project. Normally our SLAs are for, are for five years. We now have a well-defined process for archiving and sustainability when an SLA ends. As previously mentioned, the GPP is a complex project and so we have needed to undertake additional steps to ensure that we have taken the most appropriate approach to develop the collaborative workspace. Following the requirements elicitation workshop, we initially developed a proof of concept in Omega S, which at that time was not a yet fully released, that is, it was in beta um, open source platform, that we had chosen from a number of platforms evaluated to be the basis of our workspace. Evaluation of the proof of concept proved it to be insufficient for our needs, and it was suggested that the collaborative workspace be developed from scratch by the lab. The product quote we produced for GPP, again unusually, broke development into modules. This allows us to define what would be needed for a minimal viable product, for which funding has been provided by King's and the Royal Collections Trust, as well as other modules that could be included and funded through academic-led funding grants. So what will the collaborative workspace offer our users? The collaborative workspace is the one platform on which all the data streams for the Georgian papers will be offered and will allow many users to edit and augment data streams according to their own knowledge and close reading of the material. There are different types of users, those who don't require editorial access, editors such as GPP fellows or King's Friends members, moderators such as GPP partners, for example, ARPA, and administrators such as myself. These levels of user access help ensure fidelity of the data. All changes made by editors will be subject to scrutiny by moderators and administrators. Another factor to maintain data fidelity is version control, which allows for moderators and administrators to choose which version of a record and or transcription is published for display. To assist with editing of catalogue records, some fields will offer autocomplete suggestions from selected thesauri, such as UCAT, which is the United Kingdom Archival Thesaurus, and other vocabularies. Beyond the editing functionality to the more traditional uses of digital platforms, the collaborative workspace will display images and transcriptions side by side to allow for easy comparison. All of the above is included in the minimal viable product. Additional modules offer a variety of ways to browse and search the data through filtered searching, navigating archival hierarchies from collections down through series to files and items, finding items in defined date ranges, free text searching across the platform, use of wildcard characters in searching, and setting searching to exactly match, contain, or fuzzy match on search terms. Including fuzzy matching will especially help to serve audiences on both sides of the Atlantic with our different approaches to spelling the same search term. Other requirements that have been defined include allowing data aggregation from other sources or offering microsites based on GPP resources. In addition to the already funded minimal viable product, item discovery and browsing as well as the export modules have also been funded. Transcription of the Georgian papers, as mentioned, is being taken, um, undertaken and managed by our colleagues at William and Mary. Um, the tr transcriptions that are produced are diplomatic, that is, transcribed as is on the page without correction. This approach allows researchers to understand somewhat the thinking process of each item's author as they compose their writing and reveals the uncertainties inherent in transcri transcribing handwritten material. The Georgian papers transcriptions are considered raw data and could provide a foundation for further work to produce scholarly editions. The transcriptions are produced using two mechanisms. The first is the crowdsourcing transcription platform built on Omeka Classic, an open source platform 
for creating, curating and transcribing digital collections. The crowdsourcing website Transcribe the Georgian Papers has undergone significant testing by students at William & Mary, our academic leads and GPP fellows, and is now open to the public. Alongside this work, experiments with transcribers have been undertaken. Um, as Patricia mentioned, it's a handwritten text recognition tool um, that was developed as part of the Recognition and Enrichment of Archival Documents or READ project. And based on accuracy tests undertaken in that platform and recognising a need that the tool could fulfil, William and Mary are seeking funding, as mentioned before, to um, train transcribers to recognise and transcribe tabular data um, of which quite a bit of the Georgian papers is. So that's account books, inventories, household records, and other papers. Ultimately, this work will support full text search in the collaborative workspace, as well as assist in subject indexing and scholarly edition creation. It will also provide a basis for digital humanities research approaches, for example, corporate analysis. In addition to the full text search that transcriptions will offer to the collaborative workspace, other metadata enrichment will occur via editing of the baseline catalogue records to include further information, subject indexing of the papers, and name authority file creation and linking. To capture this information, the collaborative workspace is built on two main metadata standards, EAD3, encoding archival description, which is used to capture metadata for the Georgian papers themselves, and EAC CPF, or encoding archival context corporate bodies persons and families, which is used to capture information about the people and organisations referenced in the paper or in the papers. The main source of subject indexing is UCAT, um, which is based on the UNESCO thesaurus, uh, and it was established by the archives of AIM25, um, which are the archives based within the circumference of the AIM25 motorway. Uh, while undertaking test subject indexing of the Debude collection, it was apparent that there were areas in the thesaurus that could usefully be developed further. A metadata assistant and myself undertook uh, to write, derive a set of candidate terms, assess their usefulness, check them for conformance to thesauri formatting, set their relationships to terms that already exist in the thesaurus, and ingest them into UCAP. Candidate terms were drawn from the already transcribed letters of George III as published by Fortescue, a previous royal librarian and archivist, as well as from a number of the unpublished essays of the King. Other terms used were derived from Tobias, the thesaurus of British and Irish, Irish history as SCOS, which is an IHR digital project, um, military event lists, medical history controlled vocabularies, scholarly publications on the 18th century, and other sources. Approximately 900 terms have been ingested and there are several hundred more to be included. Subject indexing methods that, we, uh, that will be used include manual indexing based on what a user or editor suggests as appropriate terms and where transcription is available, we would frequency counts that may suggest topics of discussion in the papers. Other indexing that will be included in the collaborative workspace includes geographic names using geonames as a source for places as well as organisations and individuals. People and organisations are captured in a different type of record from those that hold the information of the papers. Their records are, gen, um, are called name authority files. Traditional name authority, authority files are generally used in catalogues to control for spelling. Non-standard names point to a preferred name. Uh, they assist in disambiguation using birth and death dates. You should be able to tell which the entries is the specific John Smith you're looking for. And link items in the catalogue, books, manuscripts, letters, and so on, to a particular person or organisation as the author, publisher, printer. The metadata standard chosen allows for all these functions, but also allows for much more detailed context to be included. What other names were used and when? biographical or administrative information, a person's birth and death dates, an organisation's establishment and disestablishment dates, events of significance and much more. One of the most important functions offered through the use of this metadata standard is our ability to capture the relationships between various people and organisations, which is especially important due to the complex familial and other relationships that existed both within and outside the rural household. 
Like subject indexing, name authority files can also be created manually, that is from scratch, but also can be gathered from other sources, such as the Connecting the Dots project, which contains records from Dr. Johnson's circle, uh, linking parliamentary records through metadata, the LIPARM project, the database of court offices developed by the scholar Robert Burkholz, and other material already digitized by the Royal Archives. This work supports improved search capabilities as well as browsing via exposure of relationships between people and organizations. It could also assist in the production of timelines or geographic mapping of data points. Discoverability for users, we are opening up the editorial process to them so that they may enhance the information held in the collaborative workspace, an activity that will be moderated by academic experts. As Arthur mentioned, the program is a collaborative enterprise in almost all facets, from digitization and transcription to academic engagement and dissemination. This is by design and on occasion, especially with regards to cataloging and metadata enrichment by necessity. The whole process is very much a learning curve for all parties concerned and significant teamwork and cooperation is absolutely key. Thank you very much. Um, well, questions or comments from the, from the floor? If not, I have, I have some. Jane. Okay, so I, I'm, yeah, I really welcome the, the ethos of the programme, not the project. <laughs> um, I want to press you on a comment that Arthur made about, uh, this is kind of for all of you really, about we don't have any questions of our own. Um, because I think you do. Um, it's just that those questions are more information studies questions or even media studies questions than they are historical questions. So you have questions about, like, why do we think we know the Georgians when we don't know their archives? Questions about um, what is the value of archival digitization in the context, as you mentioned, of the fact that we've got mass digitization of the pub published record, um, which has kind of made it as unable almost to digitize the archival record. And a bunch of other questions about the histories of cataloging, histories of archival practice, archival practice, which presumably are bubbling up as you're going back into and doing some of the ritual work, thinking about the choices made by curators at different times and their own kind of historical specificity. Um, and the reason with the pressure on that is around the, the comments about um, trying to kind of flatten the hierarchies in the project and not create a sense of service versus academic, because asking those kind of questions explicitly, I think gives precisely creates that parity, precisely can create that kind of credit framework that you're trying to, that you are quite, well not trying to, that you are doing. I think foregrounding them as having questions, I think gives that even more kind of strength. So I wondered if you, any of you want to comment, because the, the research questions aren't the natural historians ones, but they definitely are in there, it feels to me anyway. I, I, I can start, I mean, I was slightly uncomfortable when Arthur said we didn't have research questions. <laughs> <laughs> You've answered um, my question. <laughs> um, well, several reasons. One, because I think there isn't one big, it's yeah. not one big research That's question. Yeah. Um, there are certainly a handful of academics with, if you like, traditional historical or um, humanities research programs in their heads or in part being delivered, whether it's the history of science or naval history or um, Arthur's particular interest in statescraft or whatever. So there are those things. But I think on you're right as well about the digital side because the the whole exercise in testing transcribers for example has made us think quite hard about sufficiency of of language um we worked with colleagues in in the bentham project to to see how teachable we can find some of these things and i think some of these exercises are going to translate into the archival professional count as genuine genuine areas for innovation because very few um, uh, archive repositories have the staff they need and increasing, increasingly in the public sector some of them have virtually none so the more that we can actually begin to build those sort of processes and if we can crack tabular data which is actually gone to NEH as a research program um, we will be making a very considerable mm. contribution, I think, um, to access of a large quantity of data across the piece. I mean, Sam, you've probably got views on this one as well. I mean, every one of the things in terms of the work that I've been that 
is, is it has been looking around at what's there. So UCAT, which I think the the copy that we used had about 15,000 mm. terms. And it was really apparent um, when I was going through Debude's papers because he was a, he was a general during, um, um, a general for George III, and he was very active um, in the uh, American War for Independence, that there were particular gaps, not that it, I mean, there was a particular purpose for the, for the formation of that controlled vocabulary, which UNESCO did. And then AIM built it out with their own particular needs. But again, there's, you know, we can come to it and say, we have our own mm. particular things we can build out and make it a good resource. So there's, it's not so much is there a research question, there's recognising that there's always further research to go to contribute yeah. as, a, as a practitioner rather than a, in a rather than a, like an academic yeah. point of view, I guess. And the, the issue of use language expand, is it's sort of never ending, isn't it? Mm. I mean, whether you dress that up as, as a research question or a practitioner trying to make ends meet, as it were, mm. I, I, I think in a way it doesn't matter. Um, but we'll never have it all right because language is such a changing um, vehicle um, and it doesn't matter how often you try to get it right, you don't. And I was reminded some time ago when I was working particularly in military archives and you know we were very comfortable using propaganda to describe a variety of things um, only to discover that uh, in, in the professional fields of military studies nobody talked about propaganda anymore, it suddenly was information operations. And that thing you, you can get wrong footed by it because somebody's going to search for propaganda and they're not going to find information operations unless you've got a hierarchy that's structured in a way that, that reflects that. And any medical historian will, will reflect on the changing titles of tuberculosis over several centuries. And again, it's, it's getting that piece of the work right. And we've had issues already about um, place names and it's not... It's not because they've even the same place that you could GIS map has changed um, several times over in terms of what it's called, but the different communities will use the same name for a place several miles apart, but close enough to be confusing. And th th those, those, all those sort of handling questions, uh, which I think we are beginning to struggle with and address. <laughs> so I'm going to partly defend myself. <laughs> <laughs> I partly agree with it. That's my so, where, I, I was saying in my defence, in my claims, that there's no one overarching yeah. research question to which everybody in the project signed up. And actually, a crucial part of it, in order to be able to do the stuff that we've been talking about on the digital side here, is that lots of academics have to feel they're part of it to contribute the expertise that project needs without feeling they're just acting in their own way mm. to serve something which they're not really interested in. So everyone has to sort of feel that what they're doing is actually at the core of what we're doing. Regardless of what it is, whether it's digital, like historic, digital historical research, and of course the, the way our current funding models are set up, that's not an easy thing to say. That's our USP. That's why you should fund us. Because above all, the HRC is now saying, you know, "What's your research project about?" In a way that, in, in my big years ago for the Closure Database, you said it's research, research, resource enhancement, and actually that enables us to pursue vast numbers of interesting research agendas without having to find which was the one that we wanted the big answer to. So as someone who's also structurally sort of brought into this program as the academic director, which I think was sort of the code in some people's minds for the person who raised the money by putting in the bids to the HLC that would then able to do things, it's harder for me to translate into my kind of research project, a project that I think we're getting there now, which would actually generate the money where we actually need it for the, this pioneering work that, that will underpin it. My other sense is absolutely that going back to that thing about place names, one of the things about the closure database. Was, it was the creator of the metadata that made us realise how the entire accounts of the church bureaucracy of the 18th century that we had were wrong. Because people had just taken the existence of categorisations for, for granted in terms of jurisdictions and so on, which when we actually tried to put them into databases, you suddenly realised there was no such thing as an existing list in the jurisdiction of the Church of England that made sense. And we had to build that from scratch. And what we did there is it's pretty invisible to most people when you use that site is quite extraordinary. I mean, I spent two and a half years building a location structure for that, mm. which is one of my proudest academic achievements. Nobody will ever see it as one of my academic achievements. <laughs> it's entirely buried massively beneath the bonnet, and all this is of my closure was not there. Mm. Yeah. So keeping those those kind of sections bubbling is, 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 is problematic now, I think, in our current funding structures. And that's why, why I think it's a bit of an issue that we don't have a search question. But it's also a great strength, because all... Now, I think if we 
from the traditional academic side, our big answer may be something about the way this archive has been constructed and how that shapes our knowledge. About this period in the way she was talking about, so I think there's a lot we're picking up then. And Karen Wolf, my co academic director at the uh, Omohondra, is very interested in this theme as well. And every time we talk to the people doing the catalogue, we suddenly realize these interesting stories about why things are there are really much more complicated than some kind of you might imagine. Um, so you know, there will be another, there will be an answer there. So you're absolutely right, there were big questions here. It's just how you put in the language you need to put it in at the moment that I think is problematic. Thank you. And, and just very quickly, I think. Mean, the, the upcoming loss of access to Horizon funding, which is a scheme that does not require that kind of central one research program, research question, sorry, which is what you're, you're kind of talking about. We are, um, we are having to aim towards within the kind of the AHRC frameworks. I think is something we will mourn as well in that context mm -hmm. because, yeah, we only really have those schemes where it does that. That one big uniting research question it has to be there. Yeah. I'm, I'm on the loss of just funding too. Yes, so gosh, yes. Immensely helpful, <laughs> things like this. <laughs> so, actually, I have a question that sort of follows on for that, maybe, then we'll carry on with everybody else, and then there'll be many more burning questions. And I suppose the creation of the archive obviously frames how we see the, the Georgians, mm -hmm. and the creation of the digital project on top of that frames how we see the Georgians, and you've sort of alluded to that, and clearly there's key American partners, and the American Revolution of 13 Colony becomes a big part in how how this project is perceived. But of course, that was a small part of 18th century history in many ways. And you alluded to the European dimension, which I want to highlight. Um, so I guess if we have any comments on the, the interaction between the structures of the project and the partners that you can go to, and how that, that then shapes how, how the, uh, the Georgians are framed, I suppose. Well, obviously there's a particular issue with monarchy, in, I think, in, in two ways. One is that there's a huge popular stroke independent scholar world out there interested in monarchy on both sides of the Atlantic, which colours quite a lot of the public engagement with what we do. And obviously the stories that we could run in terms of our research activity, which will most easily gain traction outside the academy, are those with the royal dimension. It was very striking the Hamilton story that we ran became, uh, when it was presented, the story was actually about the visit of people to the archives linked to Hamilton became about Meghan and Harry going to Hamilton as the lead that got it into the Daily Telegraph as a, as a story and those sort of things. So that, that creates a certain sort of pressure because monarchy is a, is a slightly tricky thing to deal with in, 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 in people's understanding of a project because on the one hand people tend to assume that the monarchy just simply falls to pay for everything itself and that, that you know, why is this a project that requires other forms of infrastructure or support but of course it's not that simple. At all, and of course, there are sensitivities around the context where the whole discussion about the access that Patricia uh, alluded to is an important context for this project and which creates its own dynamics that people suspect we will be holding stuff back, even if we aren't. Or, mm. well, so, and in an Apache arc like this, there's always the, the theory that the reason it isn't there is because it was scattered. Of course, that is the reason some of it isn't there because it was burnt in the 18th century, regardless of what's now being done. But on the whole, we are now releasing. Everything. I don't think there's anything that's been embargoed uh, at all. But of course, who knows where that will go? You know, and, and that's a, prep, a, a work in progress. But the, but the but the whole structures of the the house of the are, are, are in that society defensive. Inevitably, there's their own. It's a private archive. What will happen to it? And that uh, to be the concern to be best practice in in, in, in every respect as possibly can. And are there ways of the digital sort of? I don't know, undermine or works against that or, or ensures that a broader route into this archive is created or links to other archives that are out there and so it's literally give certain opportunities to I mean there there are plenty of opportunities. Um one of I'm just oh one of the things I just wanted to take an opportunity to tell a little story. Um oh not that one, sorry. So yes. I mean, there are always going to be this, these ideas about what the digital can do in terms of access and, and what that means. And one of the things, just here on the left, this is a receipt. Um, I've talked to pretty much everybody about this ad nauseum. Um, this particular receipt is um, for the engravings of two guns that were given to two Māori chiefs, um, I'm Māori myself, um, who visited uh, England in 1820 
with a missionary to build um, a Māori language lexicon here. And in amongst these gifts that were given, this was given by George IV, George III had died earlier that year, um, they received many gifts. He was a very generous man. And on the way home, one of the chiefs, um, a man called Hungi Hika, traded pretty much most of it, apart from, I believe, the guns and a suit of armour that he was given. He traded it in Sydney for more guns, and he took them home, and he uh, you know, made good use of those um, because we were at war. And one of the things I think this kind of highlights is the opportunity to bring in very distant stories like that in, in, in a contextual way, because the majority of people, if they have very little understanding of uh, colonial politics, especially way out on the margins, um, won't know that story, that that act of gifting, that act of generosity had a huge um, and quite detrimental um, impact. And that's, I think, one of the potentials of this particular archive in that has connections to such a wide range of people. And I mean, it is very easy to focus on the relationships with Europe and the relationships with America, because that a, makes a big part of the archive. But there are these, these little moments of bringing in other histories which aren't as apparent um, and possibly, I'm, I'm not sure, not um, as well known here in the UK and across Europe. So. A lot of those is actually looking at disaster, disaster relief, response to mm. disaster relief way back in, which I think is, is, is another one that brings a completely different community to mind. Yeah, and, and I think that's, for all that, it's, it's very easy to focus on the prevalence of certain types of material. There are these other stories, and one of the things that I think that the Royal Archive, um, the Georgian Papers can offer is also the stories of not just the royals in that household and the courtiers, but the people, you know, below <coughs> stairs and the families that came through um, as, as servants and, and as other staff for the royal households, which of course makes it a very interesting um, project for family historians. And, and, and I would say it's one of the key drives to the collaborative workspace is that for quite a lot of those stories, the drivers are kindly from those stories have to come from elsewhere. And if you can find a way in which those archives can get into conversation with our archives mm -hmm. more effectively, the bit of the story we can contribute is a key bit, which otherwise they wouldn't be able to build in, I just mean, trying to make those points of access. We, we have a practical example coming up with collaboration from, um, with the Science Museum. As I mentioned earlier, we, we own um, King George III scientific equipment at King's, which is exhibited in the galleries at the Science Museum. That gallery is presently being redone and will be reopened with other materials in the autumn. And one of the things that we're now looking at is identifying um, what correspondence or um, accounts or whatever about acquisition there is in the Royal Archives potentially that links to those items, which is going to you know enrich the narrative at the Science Museum. And I think that's you know we can do that digitally as well as physically for the online for the actual exhibitions and I think we've got a similar possibility I think with some of the the, the maritime um, National Maritime Museum because Andrew Lambert one of our collaborators at King's um, has a strong sense that there's some really exciting material in the archives there which would enhance some of the planning um, going on at the National Maritime Museum for exhibitions and outreach. Thank you. It's really interesting. Uh, yeah, possibilities. Um, it's a question from YouTube. Oh, right. That's, um, so, a question from YouTube. Can we go for it? Okay. Okay, so it's Melody. Melody Beals asks um, Do you have any thoughts on how your choices will later affect bridges with other platforms or use by external you, external projects? And she's thinking there about particularly the choice of mess data standards, I think. And a follow on question, which is um, Have you fully documented those choices and rationales on the site itself? Uh, they are documented, they are not on the website. Um, we had a really extensive um, consideration of the metadata standards that we wanted to use. KDL, by and large, are technology agnostic in their approach to development, which basically means whatever is the best fit according to what your needs are, rather than saying, okay, well, we'll start from here and build up from that. So. 
both of the standards um, that we looked at are actually XML standards, um, and what we've done is map them into our particular um, platform. Um, they're well used by many other archival platforms. Calm, um, I don't think, oh, can it export to EAD? I think it, it can it to a rudimentary EAD. form of EAD. Yeah. Um, there's a project called Snack, which is a um, aggregator of EAC CPF records um, from a huge number of institutions across across the world. So the standards we went with are well known, um, have been either mature and they are easily shared. Um, at this point, our main focus for export is into CSV, which is so that the Royal Household can themselves ingest, but we are considering APIs um, in some form or another to be able to share this data because it's, it's no point in us locking it up. It's not in our interest no. to do so. Um, what was the other part of the question? Well, the first part was about um, thoughts about whether your choices would affect um, later bridges with other platforms or other projects. Yes, I mean, it's the nature of using any standard that you you know doesn't necessarily marry as well to others, but by and large, what we've tried to go with with our metadata standards is that they do map easily to at least most of the main metadata standards in use by information management um, professionals. So EAD3 is actually a Library of Congress um, standard, and they've got a number of um, already established maps from their standard to other standards available on their website. I could say that a little bit about um, UCAT as well. Um, the UNESCO standard was developed for pan-European use uh, and is multilingual. Um, UCAT, which is its derivative, um, was particularly developed with, on the Internet of our Partnership, but also with the National Archives, as a view of being um, an expansible, an expandable um, standard, which is why we've added in lots of specialist vocabularies to ensure multidisciplinary access. Um, its strength over Library of Congress subject headings, for example, is it's easy to build those hierarchies and to add new terms. But having said that, we have successfully in the past fuzzy matched it to Library of Congress subject headings. We've incorporated large quantities of the Getty Art and Art, art Thesaurus. We've incorporated a number of, this is not particularly part of GPP, so just generally speaking, um, large quantities of medical terminology via the welcome and the, the sources that they use. Um, so the intention is, you know, as Sam rightly says, nothing is going to be complete foolproof, but mm. the intention is to try and make it as foolproof as possible. <laughs> and there, the thing, so I think the fact that we borrowed stuff from other people who made some progress in terms of where we got our, our terms from, mm. plus the fact that in other ways we're slightly ahead of the game in this particular aspect of nature of history means I hope one of my aims would be to a place where people will come mm -hmm. when when they start their projects. And already we've got these number of conversations going on with other projects who are just getting started. Where one of the things I think I would like us to be saying is, well, don't reinvent the wheel. Mm. Come in and help us develop yeah. this bit of the metadata, which we can both then share, and that will encourage that kind of bridging. I, we're not proud because I, I just before Christmas I, I I met with the archivist at Fort and Mason, who's actually working on a food for cavalry, and their stuff goes quite quite a long way. And, suddenly occurred to me that, well, she should be joining this exercise as well. <laughs> so follow up on that, um, both your name authority files and your thesauruses, are you releasing that information? I mean, are you producing identifiers with web addresses so um, somebody can see what your, your descriptions are for a particular person, what cross-references you have, so that they can cross-reference your information to make it their own information, and particularly mm. for us in Wikidata, for instance, we would love to be able to have an identifier of yours so mm. that, along with our other identifiers, we can say, well, this is mm. what the Georgian Papers Project has. Is is there a web presence for the identifiers for the, not, the names and for the thesauruses, and is that a priority? Not at this time, because we're currently in development. I mean, as I said, with the export, an API is something that we are that we are wanting to um, 
explore how we will how we manage that. I actually use Wikidata as one of my um, sources when I do name authority file work, depending on whether I can find stuff in VF and other places. Wikidata is another one that I use. So I mean, ideally, yes, of course, there's no point in do, not do, being able to share this. And do you do you have dumps? And you're talking about CSV files. Do you have a dump? If you already really created identifiers internally that you've matched to Wikidata or to anything else. But we could eat it, we'd love to have them. Okay. Well, I will put them on my list today. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, it's, it's actually relatively small because the data, we've, we've created some, some test records. And as I said, we have a, a number of places um, that we've looked at, um, but there's a lot of data cleaning that needs to go ahead before we can actually import it into our system. And then we'll be in a position to actually be able to export it out. And at that point, we can share it. But mm. at this point, it's in, in, it's in little bits mm. and various states. When you say at that point, is that months, years? I think it'd be a steady release over time, but months could be starting. So an API might appear in months? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. Good question. No, that's, that's, thank you for that. Well, that's the kind of conversation we want to be having with people mm. at the moment, I think. So we, we, we strategize to maximize the impact and stuff. Mm. Moscow analysis. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Arthur, you said you didn't think anything was being embargoed. Um, I wasn't given access to certain materials that I requested when I was a fellow. I can't tell you what those are because I also had to sign a non-disclosure agreement that said that I wouldn't publish or release any information without the approval of the Royal Archives. Um, my question is, what is the motivation for digitizing these records, because I've done a lot of research recently on the history of digitization, and particularly in the United States in the 1980s and early 90s, a lot of it was motivated by democratizing um, access to sources about the common people. It was about promoting history from below. It was about changing the way we do history. These records are incredibly privileged records of an incredibly privileged family. I really enjoy the archive. I've had a great time working with it. I teach with it. But it's it's it what's what's the purpose why these records other than the fact that the queen apparently decided that she wanted to is there an agenda behind this is this going to change the way we do history in any kind of a tangible way well well i i mean i i am not quite sure what a what a what an acceptable answer to that would look like in, in certain ways and because it seems to me there's no reason why one shouldn't digitize the, the records of the powerful. In many ways, they're the most important if you're trying to understand what was going on that affects the lives of the unpowerful. In, in so, so I don't see the nature who creates the archives having itself a particularly pol kind of political thing. To be that, and, and maybe that, that would be more true in the days before there was much history from below. And obviously, in the 18th century, we're extraordinarily fortunate in the energy that's been put into the digitization of the records of the poor and the records of. Uh, crime and so on. I mean, we're, we're, we're massively ahead of the game compared to other centuries on that front. And actually what's bizarre about the 18th century at the moment is because of the success of that project, the discount of which the study of the, the powerful and the elites of this period has fallen into has left us rather they're 30 years out of date in our understanding of the workings of elite power in this period. And it needs to catch up. And trying to find one of my biggest struggles is actually finding enough academics to comment on this material because nobody's been looking at it for 25 years. Uh, really, so not just about not, giving access. In well, I, I think it's also to much. So, for one, for me, one, and this is obviously just a personal game, it's not something that stimulated others, but actually, I'm desperate for people to get back to looking at this stuff, not least as we're living in a world where it's quite clear to us at the moment that constitutions matter, that the actions of hybrid politics and how they you know, can have real world consequences and. We do need to understand treaties and things like this in a way because they affect our lives in, in, in a good way. And that's not a kind of Andrew Robertsy call to say everybody should be doing this and nothing else, uh, in, or that it should replace other forms of history, but just we have such a rich texture in the 18th century at the moment. We need to insert these records back in because the digital possibilities of looking back in are so remarkable here where you could match elite and non-elite records in all kinds of ways and simply wouldn't be possible in most So it's a rebalancing that. Well, and for me, that's part of it. Now, I think for the, for the, the, for the, for the palace, as, as Patricia was implying, mm -hmm. I think there's a, a genuine sense that their earlier efforts to, to open up the archive through digital 
had been less successful than they hoped because of that. And, and this, this is that they can only do that with the records they have. They feel themselves as people who have a, a public, you know, public service ethic that, mm. that, that these are in some sense the nation's records. Obviously, they're actually the climate records of the Queen, but they want to coach it. And as you know, when you go to the archive, there is no other way access can be done because it's a very small physical space. And once you get in there, as you, as you were saying earlier, there are certain rules that apply once you get into that space that apply, I think, because of the nature of the space, that will not apply in the digital version of these. Are they planning on removing the access to the original records once this is finished? Is this a preservation not, thing? Not as far as I mean, it may well lead to that particular place, but I don't think there's any uh, proof. Not that we know no. of. No. Um, because, again, it is only a very small part, and this is one of the smallest bits of the Royal Archive that's there, because of the Victorian papers are massive in comparison to, to this. So it's meant that, that in, and unless you actually say, I can only look at one particular bit, th 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 there's going to be a huge uh, amount of work still to be done. I mean, one of the, the conversations that happened early on in King's with why would we want to be involved is, was around the whole piece of contextualizing the, the, the elite within 18th century society. And there are an awful lot of records in the Royal Archives that would support that work in terms of, the account books and the supplier lists and the networks. And yes, okay, an amount of that's at a very high and unique level. But there's also an awful lot of it that's at a very low level about who's supplying the Savoy cabbages and that sort of thing. And, and who's doing the farm work and um, what the babies are being fed and not just necessarily the royal babies. So that, that I think that's quite interesting. And when, when our, in, early on, our um, the historians of material culture um, or children's education and that sort of thing, we're all looking at it, they were actually thinking there's actually potentially a lot of interesting things there which tell us a, a lot about society at large, as well as um, influencing networks, I think. I mean, what, one thing I would say, and this again in a very personal perspective, mm -hmm. is that one of my abiding impressions of the 18th century as a historical field is, and I'm sort of move back to the 19th century in, in my own career, is just how shallow the historical record is between the, the absolute elite and knowledge of actually quite pers the individual persons mm -hmm. elsewhere in the social structure through a certain set of patronage relationships. You very, and George III in particular has a very particular interest in the micromanagement of patronage and locally, he knows his local communities. So actually there's a lot of material in here that's not about elites, but, but tells, brings together records that relate to quite specific localities in, in quite a lot of detail. And he was sort of interested in political economy and the effects of policy. So, so there is material there for, for, for all kinds of study. There was odd gaps. There's less about slavery than you might imagine, for example. So a lot of people have been into look at that they've not found a vast amount, but what they found is genuinely very interesting that particular context, particular situation, particular relationships, where you move very rapidly from the top of the hierarchy down to things that have been done on the ground to uh, people who themselves were not in that historical record. Um, I mean, uh, just um, thinking, Arthur, that when the time comes for the uh, two Georges ex exhibition, um, either in America or nicer for us, as it were, uh, when it's here at the Science Museum, uh, it there could be a wonderful round table if if you um, if if you were you Patricia and Sam were joined by those who've worked over the years in the, at the University of Virginia on the George Washington papers, mm -hmm. which has been ongoing digi the digitization project since the nineteen seventies mm -hmm. and is not yet finished and. That's an example of where the fact that it's not finished doesn't, I mean, nice what it is, but the uh, extraordinary uh, you know, metadata, the, the, the ways that they, are, that they learn all the time, I mean, from the editors of the papers that I've spoken to and new projects that I'm embarking on the digitization of Martha Washington's papers, and so it would be a wonderful sort of digital history offshoot from the exhibition if there were, even if it was some um, 
something on the uh, uh, escape yeah. round table. But, uh, it, no, I mean, the petition actually and I were both lucky enough to be carted out to the Huntington Library uh, this spring for, 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 for the round table on digital early America, which we were one of about 10 projects, including the Washington Papers, that swapped notes mm. about a whole range of issues about how one did public engagement, about how one sustained funding, how one shared standards mm. and materials, and some of that will be reflected in the issue of the William and Mary Quarterly. Uh, yeah, I'm particularly keen on how they were handling accounting records, because I think that was an issue that's been challenging us. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that conversation is one, and the, 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 the key is to how to get people who are outside digital humanities to understand why that would be worth listening to. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. it doesn't disappear a kind of technical workshop or mm -hmm. whatever, but actually is fundamental to how we understand these materials. And that still seems to be the great struggle for all of these projects is to understand, get people to understand what they've got to learn for the fact that they're digital projects rather than just that it's a, it's a web page you can get. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you talk about full text search coming in and doing the um, transcribe as transcriptions. I've used this resource, just this term, for the first time mm. teaching undergraduates. And the thing that I like the best about it is that it doesn't have search, because it got me, it gave me the ability with a really high quality archive to teach them about how archives work. And I hate full text archives for teaching because students go quote searching. Mm. So they look for evidence that lets them find what they need to put into their essay so that they can go to the box. Like that, I'm pretty sure that's what is the entire purpose of undergraduate education, to get the quote as quickly as possible. And I want them to understand the collection. So I'm worried that you're going to break this by making it more usable. <laughs> I apologize profusely for that. I mean, I, 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 mean, I think that's really understandable. Um, but one of the things is, is that we don't think, I, I wouldn't say we think it's very likely we're going to run out of transcription anytime soon. So there will always, I think, be areas, there will always be areas. And I mean, for students to investigate that and do that close reading, learn about paleography and sit there and go, ah, what is that word? And then, you know, get everybody into a discussion about that. Um, be nice if you could turn off. Yeah, and that, I, I, I recognise what I'm saying. But the, the funny thing happens to you is, is that that in all the people I've expected to, to have said that, you know, it takes back to when I started digital work and I got my grant, first grant from the AHRB, as it was then, 1998, as a junior lecturer, and I went into my head department to report that I'd got the grant and. I, I was quite chuffed because the three of us were all quite junior people had gone by a million quid and whatever. And he said, This is a disaster. A, because it will mean you will never write a book and your career is finished and you'll never get promotion. And B, because you made the search too easy. <laughs> and, it, and it will actually stop people doing proper research. And that's why I always focus on about driving back to the archive rather than replacing it. But you know, it it, it, I mean, it is it is often one of the things that said by other people that's or used to be said about about what digital does. Mm. It, it breaks down the research process. And I think you are right, because actually that's one thing that's rewarding about my teaching out of this too, is that just letting these undergraduates loose without so they have an entirely free choice about which document they can do. But actually they have to work out how to identify which document they can do, and they can talk to an archivist, Oliver Walton, to help them make that decision and me. But actually they have to think through how would I find something that would be of interest using the, the search, the, the hierarchical structures, and we do a session on how does an archive work, how do you navigate an archive, how do you make sense of where you might find things, why don't somebody do another thing where they have to search for the Battle of uh, Yorktown in the National Archives, using their approach to searches where they find nothing, and then we show them how you find the oodles of stuff that actually are there by navigating down to the, through the hierarchies to work out where it should be. And that makes us say very wary. So that's the way I would do it, is I actually show them why the other approach doesn't work right at the outset if, if we get them that happy work. You have to work. start with that idea of teaching them that they're not looking for quotes. Yes, so you say, and actually what goes them. wrong when you follow the, the obvious way of looking for the quotes. And just just as you, now I still use you all the time in my teaching just to say why OCR should worry you. <laughs> right at the outset, all these things that you can't just rely on what you get back. And, and I think you can sober students up quite, the right kind of students, 
quite quickly with that information about why you still need to know how archives work, even if they're digitised. And it'd still be nice to be able to do the searches. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, one of the things when I was first being trained on um, digitisation many years ago, and I was working on a series of letters that a um, academic at the university um, that I was based at um, had written to his mother while he was here at university. And they always started, Dear Mummy. Like, he never actually used her name at all. Who's, who's Mummy? I mean, that, like, in, in that sense, like, if there's a per particular term that you know a thing as, I mean, all of the stuff which might be relevant, but uh, completely different sorts of terms or different names or different things are just lost to you. And that's, I guess, a limitation of um, our training of, of students around, you know, effective search mechanisms and things like that. Like, you know, mummy can find you mummy, but if you don't know what, who that actually is signifying, then it's... Well, sort of, PR comes up, Princess Royal comes up all yeah. the time and stuff, and it's, if you don't know who PR exactly. is, you don't figure out. So there are always, I think, you know, the search could be amazing, but there will always be challenges. And I think that's the bit that we really need to focus on in terms of that literacy, of, of and especially in teaching, because, I mean, I think there is the assumption in the Google age that you just put in and it gets, you get back exactly what you need. And that's yeah. not true necessarily all of the time. But that's you know, the big challenge about all history teaching now is the draw that we can use digital to find the right way to use it in the classroom so that it doesn't just become a Google. So and designing actually, assignments so they test Yeah, exactly. Those and and I mean, it's not that hard to do because if you know as much as you know, and as much as I, even I know, and I know nobody knows what you, you can build, if you're, if you're given the freedom to do it, ways in which you can put a lot of responsibility on students to get it right. And actually, they find it incredibly rewarding mm. when they start trying to do it because it's just so unlike anything they've been asked to do before. But it does require to people who know how archives work in the room. Um, Not. Um, so I say thank you very much for such a stimulating uh, talk and answering questions and discussion. And uh, clearly, what is such a groundbreaking project, which will, as we suggested here, change the way not only we look at history, but sort of how we look at digital projects. Um, but thank you all very much. Thank you.